When I was 11 years old, I had never heard of church. I had never heard of God. I never heard of the Bible. Um, but when I was in the sixth grade, one of my classmates invited me to go to church with her one weekend. And what she didn't know is that the day I stepped across the threshold of that church and all of these strangers embraced me and loved me, uh, what they didn't know is that I had already attempted suicide twice by the time that day came. Um, I grew up in a very traumatic situation where physical, emotional, and sexual abuse was part of my daily existence. And um, the day that I sat in that church, I heard the gospel preached and the pastor said that God is a father of the fatherless. Uh, what he didn't know is that I had lost my dad um, two months shy of my second birthday. And I had often thought that none of the bad things that happened to me would have happened if I had had my father. So at 11 years old, because my friend invited me to church, um, I discovered that there was a father who loved me, even though my earthly father wasn't there. Who loved her even though her earthly father wasn't there. Amen. Hey, well, it's great to be here with you all. Uh, thank you to, to both Chelsea's for helping us out. I got to say, uh, Chelsea, wonderful job on that illustration. Uh, when I was a student pastor, uh, I think it was probably my second or third week uh, being a student pastor, and I tried to do that same illustration, and it didn't work at all. <laughs> I forgot the key to, to practice it, so thank you for doing that well and showing us that example there. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, if, I, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is uh, Chase. I serve as one of the pastors here in Nordonia. And uh, this week, we are in week four out of five of our series called Who's Your One? And as I mentioned in the first week of this series, uh, we're not doing this on our own, uh, but in collaboration with hundreds, maybe even thousands of churches all around the world uh, who are praying that the Lord will, will show us one person who all of us can be used by God to share the good news of Jesus with. And the church that came up with this, a church called Summit Church in North Carolina, uh, they've put many resources and testimony videos like the one we just saw uh, showing people who were either someone's one uh, or people who were able to share the gospel with their one in those stories. And, you know, I wish I could show you all of those uh, videos. They're just remarkable. Uh, but one of the things that, that I'm praying for and hopefully we'll be able to do uh, is that we'll be able to make some of those videos from within our own church. And so uh, if you are able to have a gospel-centered conversation and you're willing to, to share it with all of us, uh, we'd love to put that onto a video. Or if maybe you were someone's one at some point and you would be willing to share that story, uh, I would love it if we could make some of our own videos just like the one that we just saw. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week, Lord willing. But uh, with that said, if your Bible's open to Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read starting in verse 11. And I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter this week, although we're only going to be uh, focusing on up to verse 24, and then we'll finish the rest of this chapter next week. So Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And it says, And he said, this is Jesus talking, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when, he had come to, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered it to his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said, Son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather here. Thank you for allowing us all to arrive safely. Lord, I pray that you will teach us something new about you this morning, something about ourselves. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I want to start off uh, this morning, this message, by telling you a terrifying story. And many of you may remember this story. It's a, it's a true story. I remember reading about it in a book when I was probably 10 or 11. But before I tell you the story, I need to tell you that everything turned out all right. Okay, it's a disastrous, kind of heart-wrenching story. It's a story that'll probably make you a little bit claustrophobic. It might even make your stomach turn a little bit and your skin kind of crawl, but it's a true story. And again, everything turned out all right. The story I want to tell you about is the story of Jessica McClure, or as the nation came to know her as Baby Jessica. Okay, on October 14th, 1987, in Midland, Texas, Jessica McClure, who was 18 months old at the time, was playing in her aunt's backyard when she slipped, or more like fell, into an open well. So basically a large pipe in the ground. And she slipped down 22 feet beneath the surface of the ground and was wedged in that pipe with one leg over her head. It kind of gives me chills right, to even think about an 18-month-old girl falling down into a well. And for the next 58 hours... The entire nation, and many of you remember, I see some some heads nodding. The entire nation was concentrated on baby Jessica and how this situation would be resolved. Now remember, spoiler alert, okay, this this turned out all right, but but just imagine for a second the emotions that, that the parents would have been feeling and the family members, let alone the little girl who had slipped down into that well. Well, thank God for engineers who came up with a plan to to drill a parallel hole next to the pipe where baby Jessica was stuck. And and they went deep enough down uh, to drill down into the well, uh, just beneath the baby. And then someone, some hero, went down into the ground and took the little girl in their arms and brought her up to the surface where she uh, is alive and well to this day. Now, why would I bring us back to this dreadful you know, emotional, fear-filled moment like that morning. Well, well, because I think that emotion that we feel when we hear that story is as close as we can get to the emotion that's evoked and building in Luke chapter 15. If you remember all the way back to the, the very first week of this year, we said that uh, we looked at Luke chapter 14 and the end of Luke chapter 14 and saw the cost of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, right? It's costly to be a disciple. Church isn't just a, a social club where we come to, to hang out with those who are like us, but it's really almost a refueling ground for us to be refueled before we go back out into the battlefield Monday through Saturday. And so uh, that's where we're actually engaged in the mission of making disciples. And likewise, being a Christian, it's not just uh, some identity, you know, check mark that we check off when we fill out a census, but it, it's who we are to the core. It's costly to follow Jesus. And then the next week, we looked at uh, Pastor Happy walked us through the beginning of Luke chapter 15, where, where uh, we saw that God cares about his children, 
So much that even if just one out of a hundred is lost, he'll go and seek out the one and leave the 99. That doesn't mean he doesn't care about the 99. He does. He cares deeply about the 99, but he cares so much about the one that he'll leave the 99 to go make sure the one is safe. And then last week, Pastor Valmir did a wonderful job of walking us through verse 8 through 10 of chapter 15 and showing us the parable of the lost coin. And how the particular coin that the woman had lost, uh, losing one of those 10 coins was, was kind of like in today's day and age, losing an engagement ring. And so uh, she would pretty much turn the whole house upside down until she could find that lost coin. And then now we come to the third and final parable in this chapter, where if you have an ESV Bible, uh, you see that it's called the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. I don't like that name uh, personally. We'll get to that in a second. But, but I want you to, to notice the, the building of significance in that which was lost. Right? In the first parable, when the, when the shepherd loses a sheep, he, he loses one out of 100. When, when the lady loses a coin, she loses one out of 10. So we move from one 100th to one tenth, and then now one out of two are lost. But even more than that, the intrinsic value of what's lost builds as well. When the, when the shepherd lost the sheep, you know, he, he cared for the sheep that was lost, but sheep by nature are going to produce more sheep. When, when the lady lost the coin, that, that meant even more because it would be a mark on her character and, and there would be a stigma attached to her. And so uh, she, it, it was important that she found that coin. But now we get to this last parable and it's the loss uh, of a child. And so do you see the progression from sheep to uh, kind of engagement to, to a child. And so after hearing all of these parables, I think the weight that Jesus wanted to bring out in the original listeners is tantamount to the weight that's, uh, and the burden of those that felt, uh, felt sitting in front of that TV waiting to see what would happen to baby Jessica. But just like the horrific, claustrophobic story, it would turn out all right, at least for one of the sons in this story, and that's who we're going to focus on today. So I usually have multiple points uh, as, we're, as we're working through, uh, through a message, I only have one point for you today, and it's this. You cannot out the grace of God. Just run to the Father. You cannot out the grace of God. Just run to the Father. That's what we're going to break down this morning, and then we'll finish this parable uh, and, this, and this whole series next week. So let's look again, starting in verse 11. Verse 11. Remember, Jesus is talking. We just read it. We'll read it again. It says, and he said, there was a man who had two sons. Okay, now right away, how many sons did he have? Two sons, right? How many sons? Two sons. But it's called the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son so often. And, and right away, I think that's problematic because if we're not careful, then we'll start to think that the parable actually ends in verse 24. But the lesson that we learn from the second son, the oldest son, in the last seven verses are just as important. In fact, it might be even more important for many of us. And so uh, I want us to keep that in mind. We'll get to the older son next week, but just because we're stopping at verse 24 today uh, doesn't mean that the lessons from the older son are not equally as important. In fact, if you know that you're not going to be here next week, I would highly encourage you to, to go back and listen to the message that Lord willing will be preached next week because this parable is not complete without hearing about the older son. But this morning, we're just looking at the younger son. And what does he do? Well, we read it earlier, verse 12. It says, And the younger of them said to his father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Okay, now, now you've got to understand right away that, that, that he's not saying, uh, hey, Dad, uh, can you give me my allowance? Right? He's not saying, Dad, can you give me the money that you owe me? He, he wasn't asking for an advance on a payment that was due, but no, he was asking for his inheritance. Now, now this might have been a normal procedural request if the father had already died. Okay, there were laws in place for how inheritances were to be distributed. The oldest son was to get the most. Everybody say amen. Uh, the, then the rest was distributed according to the law. But, but, but all of this was after the father had already died. Right? For a child to ask for their inheritance from their father while the father was still alive wasn't just to go against cultural laws and, and regulations, but it was essentially for the younger son to go to his father and say, Father, I wish that you were dead. <laughs> 
Right? Have you seen the old commercials? You know, it's my money and I want it now. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you're taking too long. Uh, I wish that you were dead. And the father gives him what he asked for. He gives him his portion of the inheritance. But the father could have rebuked him in the moment. He could have disowned him. He could have said, oh, you, you want me dead? No, you're dead to me and disowned him. But for whatever reason, the father fulfills his request. And so to put it in the contemporary illustration, you know, the son packs up his U-Haul truck and heads out of town. And verse 13, it says that he squandered his property in reckless living. Some translations say in prodigal living. See, the term prodigal son is used all throughout our culture, right? You might be watching a movie or a show and, and uh, one of the family members who's been gone for a long time finally comes back and inevitably one of the characters will say, uh, the prodigal child has returned, right? And I'm sure all the, you know, Hollywood writers were giving each other high fives when they came up with that. But, but, but the word prodigal doesn't mean for someone to leave and come back. No, the, de- the definition of the word prodigal, it means spending money or resources freely and recklessly to be wastefully extra, uh, extravagant. Okay, so, so the, the word prodigal has nothing to do with his decision to leave the home or his decision to come back to the home, but in reference to how he was living when he was gone from the home. So the son uses up all the money, and what happens? Right, there's a famine. There's a famine in the land, and because he's lived recklessly or prodigally, uh, now he's in trouble, and so the recession is hit, right? The, the market collapsed, his, his father's money has run out, and so he needs a job. And so what does he do? He goes and he gets a job feeding pigs. And now we might look at this and say, okay, great. He's working on a farm. This is great for him. It's going to build character to, to work here. But, but if, if we think that, then we're looking at this through our 21st century lenses. Because the original listeners would have heard this and, and known that for a Jewish individual to work with, with an unclean animal, such as a pig, we'll talk about that uh, in the next series in Leviticus, what, what animals were unclean and clean, for him to work with unclean animals uh, was about as low as you could possibly go. And, and he's not just working with the unclean animals, but look at verse 16. It got so bad that he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Okay, so he's, he's starving. He's looking at these, the food, the pigs would have eaten these, these pods that were essentially seeds that fell off the tree, and it's impossible for the human stomach to digest those pods. And so he's looking at these pods and, and saying, I'm so hungry, I wish I could eat that, but I can't even eat that. I have no food, and I'm longing to eat what these unclean animals eat. In other words, he's at rock bottom. Author and pastor Max Licato, he tells a story about a pet bird named Chippy. Now, I, you might not know this about me. I love dogs. I love all pets, but I have a special place for birds. We had a parrot growing up, and, and uh, I'm still almost, I think, convinced Amanda that we can get a parrot maybe one day. Uh, but, but I love birds, and so when I heard this story of this bird, this parakeet named Chippy, it resonated with me, and it stuck with me. And so Chippy, the story goes, was a, a happy bird. He liked to sing and, you know, make a joyful noise to the Lord until one day, Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. And so the owner, you know, Chippy's in the cage and the owner's vacuuming out all the, uh, all the, the feathers and all the dust and all the stuff in the cage. And, and the owner's phone rang and she turned around to answer the phone and, and <laughs> Chippy got sucked into the vacuum cleaner. That's what that sound effect was. And so uh, the bird owner screamed and ran and, and opened the vacuum, and, and thankfully Chippy was in there, you know, dazed, but, but still alive. And so she pulled Chippy out of, the ca- or out of the vacuum cleaner and ran to the sink and immediately ran the bird underwater. And, and uh, it was cold water, and so all the feathers and dust were removed, but now the bird's shivering. And so the owner said, oh, well, I've got to do something. And so she reached for a hairdryer. And uh, you can imagine Chippy didn't even know what hit him as he got torpedoed by this stream of hot air. And so the bird was fine. Uh, and so a couple of days later, the person who had originally called, uh, called the owner again to, to see how the bird was doing. And the owner said, well, Chippy's alive, uh, but he doesn't sing anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> right? It's not so hard to imagine why. You get sucked into a vacuum cleaner, run under cold water, and then shot across the room with a stream of of hot air, right? That's enough to to steal the song from any of us. Well, I think if we're honest, many of us know what it's like to have our song ripped away from us like that. 
right? to be going through our life thinking that we're, what we're doing is best, living our best life, and then uh, an external circumstance comes up that rips the joy away from us. And sometimes those circumstances and trials are beyond our control, but other times, if we're honest, other times, not all the time, but sometimes, just like the lost son in this passage, the mess that we find ourselves in is brought on by our own wrong choices. But look at verse 17. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, if you underline things in your Bible, you might want to underline that phrase right there. That's a sermon in and of itself. When he had come to himself, most translations say when he had come to his senses. So see, when you hit rock bottom, and many of us in this room know that experience, when you hit rock bottom, there's the realization that the only way to go is up. And and with that realization can come a a sense of debilitating hopelessness that, that we're stuck. Or maybe we try and build ourselves up or pull ourselves up from by our own bootstraps and usually that makes the mess uh, even worse and we end up right back where we were. But sometimes when we hit rock bottom, we can be awakened by the prompting of the Holy Spirit to realize that just like the hymn writer says, true hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. See, see his realization of of his circumstances at the heart of this parable about the first son. And we'll get to the response of the father in a second, but there would be no response by the father if the son had not come to the realization of his brokenness and that there needed to be a response by the father. Let me put it as simple as I can. This parable is to show us that all of us, right, from birth are born with a condition called sin. And that sin, even if we don't think that it's that big of a deal, or we think it's just part of being a human, or we're not that bad, or we're, we're mostly good. Listen, even the smallest bit of sin in our lives is enough to permanently ban us from God's presence. And there's good news coming, but like we always say, the good news is only good news in light of the recognition of the bad news, which is that we're all broken. And until we come to the recognition of our brokenness, our, our sinfulness, until we come to our senses like the younger son here, then there is no good news. So we started off today by talking about baby Jessica and her seemingly hopeless predicament stranded 20 feet down below the surface of the earth, one leg up in the air. Could there be a more uh, hopeless and helpless scenario than a baby in a well? And as the engineers struggled to come up with a plan, there there was never a plan to, to have baby Jessica aid in her own escape from the well. Right? No one said, let's lower a rope down and get her to grab onto it, because they knew that she couldn't do it. No one said, uh, let's just encourage her and tell her how great she is and she'll, so she'll be motivated to climb up herself out of the well because they knew it wouldn't work. No one said, you know, what she really needs are just a list of instructions on how to step-by-step step get yourself out of this situation. No, they, they, they knew that instructions and, and kind words and platitudes were not enough to save her. No, she needed someone to come down from above and stoop down to her level and bring her up to the surface. Friends, our great God, knowing that we would not and could not bridge the gap between God and man on our own, he became one of us, right? Coming down to our level so that, so that we could have a way to not perish in our sins and darkness, but so that one day we could enter into his kingdom and not just as servants or, or second-class citizens, but as sons and daughters of the king. Look at these words from Romans 8. I'm reading in the NLT because I think it just makes it abundantly clear. Romans 8, verse 15. It says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins us with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. We're his heirs. And so what does that mean for us today? Or maybe some who came in here or are watching online, maybe you feel like right now in your life you're at rock bottom. Well, how does this parable offer us hope when we hit the rock bottom in our lives? What, well, what does it mean? Well, what it means for us is simply what we said earlier, that you cannot out the grace of God. Just run to the Father. Right? No, notice how this passage here in, in Romans, uh, there, there's no qualifier. Right? It doesn't say, you're God's child unless you did this in your past. It doesn't say you're God's 
child unless you were with her or with, or with him. No, no, no. It says uh, that, that once you've received God's spirit, you're his child. And all it takes to receive God's spirit is, is to come to your senses and realize your need for him and to call out for him. And to say, Heavenly Father, I'm not worthy to be called your child, but, but you've made a way for me by sending your son Jesus, and I want you to be king of my life. All we have to do is, like the younger son, humble ourselves right, and say, God, I want to serve you. And he'll say, uh, I'll, I'll do you one even better. I'll make you my son or daughter. If we've read this parable and we've got someone else in our mind as the lost child here, I think we're missing the point. That the point is not that someone, our family member, or, or our friend need to return to Christ. No, the point is that all of us need to cry out to the Father. And so I've got to ask, have you done that? And right? have you cried out to God and said, God, I want to make you Lord of my life? Or are you burdened by, by the sins of your past, thinking that whatever you've done, you might not be forgiven? Because you will. Because the God that we serve is the loving father who we see in this parable. And how does he react? Well, let's finish the story. The son comes up with a plan. He says, uh, I'm going to go home. I'm just going to ask my dad if I can become one of his servants, right? He realizes even the servants in the house are eating better than he's eating. And so he says, I'm just going to ask to be a servant. Maybe, maybe I can even start to, to pay off an ounce of the debt that I've occur, recurred here. But look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to celebrate. Right? He was dead, and now he's alive. We'll talk more about what that means next week. But I want you to notice something in this parable. I want you to notice, when did the father see him? Right? Was it when the father was at home watching you know, TV, watching the playoff games, heard a knock on the door and went and answered it, saw it was his son and said, oh, this is awkward. Was he out in the field working and, and a servant came up and said, hey, your, your son's here. No, it says it was when he was still a long way off. That the son was still a long way off. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the father was waiting for him. Right? He was looking for him. He notices him off in the distance because he was waiting for his son. Now, now, now catch this. I, I learned this not too long ago. I think this is powerful. Okay, the, the reason the, son, or the father in this parable would have been waiting for his son is because in that culture, if there was a child who had disrespected their father and just went off like the younger son had, it would have been socially acceptable and even socially commendable for the village elders, when they saw the son coming back, to grab the son, bring him to the center of the village, and smash a pot at his feet. And what they were essentially saying is that uh, just like this pot is broken, the relationship between you and this, and this community is severed forever. Right? Whether it was a son that left or a daughter that was left, they were saying that, that he or she is banished from that community. You don't belong here anymore. And see, the father, he, he knows that if the village elders get to the son first, then that judgment will be pronounced on him and that he's banished forever. And so the story says that the father sees his son a long way off, and so he runs. Right? In, in this culture, it was shameful for the patriarch of the family to, to, you'd have to bare your legs and lift up your robe and run, and that was seen as, as shameful. Boys ran, but not men. But this father, he runs to his son and embraces him, and he puts a ring on him, and he celebrates Friends, this is a picture of what God, our Heavenly Father, does when we put our trust in Him. He embraces us and He showers us with grace and there's a celebration. The, the hymn writer says it like this, and I have to wonder if he was thinking about the, this parable here, particularly verse 18, when he wrote, it's a hymn called, Come Ye Sinner. And it says, Come ye weary, heavy laden. Anyone feeling weary and heavy laden this morning about the state of the world that we live in? Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost 
and ruined by the fall. If you tarry or if you wait till you're better, you will never come at all. He says, I will arise and go to Jesus. That's straight out of Luke 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. That there are 10,000 charms. And that's what the younger son experiences. Right? As there's this party. They, they kill the fattened calf and they party. And, and as an aside, have you noticed all of this talk throughout Luke 15 about celebration? When the, when the shepherd finds the sheep, he celebrates. When the woman finds the lost coin, they celebrate. When, the, when, the, when uh, the, his son returns, they celebrate. And they don't just celebrate by themselves. No, they throw parties with, with others. I think when we come to, to this parable, particularly this part in the parable, I think all of us that are listening, whether we're here in the room or watching online, all of us fall into one of three categories. One of three categories. Number one, we know that we've experienced the love, or we know that we haven't experienced the love of the Father as it's seen in this parable. Maybe you're here, maybe you're at rock bottom in your life, or maybe things are going well actually in your life. But either way, if you're honest, you don't know what it's like to have security in the fact that you're a son or a daughter of the risen King Jesus. In fact, maybe even that, that phrase, son or daughter of King Jesus, just sounds like Christianese. You don't really even know what that means. Well, if that's you, may I encourage you, don't leave here today without talking to someone, to, to myself or one of our other leaders. There, there won't be any judgment because like I said, all of us are fallen. All of us are broken and deeply in need of a savior and forgiveness. And you'll find that forgiveness at the cross of Jesus. The second group in here today or, or watching online are those of you who do believe that you are sons or daughters of Jesus, but yet you feel distant. And maybe you've been longing for a long time to, to return to the joy of salvation that you once felt when you first became a follower of Jesus. And if that's you, I want to give you the same encouragement. Just call out to the Father because he wants to have this relationship with you and, and he loves you. Romans 8 says, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. And so I want to encourage you that maybe today, can be a day where maybe even you rededicate your life to Christ and just re-recognize that truth and call out to Jesus. Then there's a third group here. At those who are walking confidently in a relationship with Jesus and you're secure in your salvation, knowing that your heavenly father loves you. Well, if you're in that group, then I want to challenge you to remember that at one point you were lost. That even if you don't remember that, if, if you are, have been a Christian for as long as you can remember and your parents were the ones that shared the gospel with you at a young age, all of us really have the same testimony. And that's that one point in our, loss, we were, in our life we were lost and far from Christ until we came to saving faith in him. And so my challenge for you in this third group is to realize that in the same way a message was shared with you, it's your responsibility to share it with others. Which brings us back to our series, Who's you're one. And who's one person who you can share the good news of Jesus with this year? So that like the lady in the video in the beginning of this message, they can be introduced to a relationship with their heavenly father. I want to end our time together a little different than we usually do here at the chapel in Nordonia. You might have noticed around the room there's some, some things set up and uh, we are going to finish by singing a couple songs and finish with communion as always. But before we do that, I want us to have an extended time of reflection, of prayer, and maybe even rededicating ourselves to the Father this morning. And I want to do it in several tangible ways. For some of us, this might take us out of our comfort zone a little bit, but I think that's good and necessary from time to time. But my hope is that during this time, we'll be intentional about focusing on the fact that when we read the story of the prodigal son, we shouldn't have someone else in our mind, but our own story. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, if you look around the room, you'll see four different stations. Uh, each of them have a sense on it. There's a uh, sound, sight, smell, and touch. And then we'll finish at the end of our service by taste, by taking communion together. So in just a second, there's going to be a 15-minute timer that comes on the screen. 
And I want you to make the most out of these 15 minutes. It's not just, it's not 15 minutes per station, but 15 minutes all together. And here's what's going to happen at each station. Uh, these are not in any particular order, but at the station that says site over there, uh, you can, again, go to these in any order, but there's several testimonies scattered all over the table uh, from men, women, and children who recently gave their lives to Christ in some remarkable ways. All right, so I highly encourage you to read just a few of those. You don't read all of them. Uh, most of them are front and back pages over there, but my hope is that uh, you'll be encouraged and maybe even see some parallels uh, in your story and theirs as you read them. At the smell station, so it's kind of hard to explain, so I'm just going to say just follow the instructions that are on the, on the, on the, uh, on the paper over there, but uh, you'll be able to s- literally smell an illustration of what it means for us to be made new in Christ. At the touch station over here, this one's probably my favorite, uh, you'll see several bowls of water, and what we have next to the bowls are dissolvable pieces of, of paper. And so what I want to encourage you to do is write down uh, something that you're struggling with, a sin struggle. We all have them. I have them. We, every single person in this room struggles with something. And I want you to write it on that paper and then literally feel like what it's like to, to wash that away at the foot of the cross. Okay, so again, there's instructions over there as well that I hope if that didn't make sense. And then lastly, the cross uh, behind me, uh, those who were going to help bring that up, you guys can bring that up now. Uh, this one's pretty specific. Uh, uh, what I want you to do is to write on the paper that's been given on the table here something that you've been saved from. Okay, you can be as literal or vague as you want. You know, you can write uh, addicted or, or anxious or, or prideful. You know, who, uh, a description of who you were before Christ. Maybe it's distrusting or, or angry. And then on the other side of the paper, you can write an attribute that describes you in Christ. So free or joyful or loving. And then what we're going to do, uh, there's envelopes. So these are all anonymous. Don't put your name on it. Uh, but we're going to actually literally nail these to the cross. And so after you write it and you put it in the envelope, uh, take, take that and take a nail out of the bowl and literally nail it to the cross. And uh, for these 15 minutes, we'll hear the hammer and the nail ringing out and we'll constantly be reminded of what Jesus did for us. Now there's hand sanitizer as well at all, at, at all the stations. I, I do want to say just... You know, I, I've done this enough times to know how this works, right? All right, sometimes there's some of you in here that could spend 15 minutes at just one station, right? And so you're going to have to make the most of these 15 minutes and try to make it to other. Uh, others of you are, uh, might be prone to just fly through these and be done in three minutes and 37 seconds, I'm trying to set a record or something. Right? That's not what this is about. So please take your time and really be intentional about focusing at each one of these stations. And then in just a, a minute, uh, when the 15-minute timer's done, Our band will come up and lead us in in two final songs and then we'll take communion and be done. So let me pray and then we'll get up and move around these stations for the next 15 minutes. Father, thank you that you've made a way for us to come back to you. That all of us at some point in our life were the lost son that's described in this parable. Lord, give us a, a holy realization of what that means. Lord, for anyone here who isn't walking with you or knows that they're not a follower of Christ, Lord, would you use these moments to to call out to them and draw them near to you? Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's start the timer and let's get up and move around to these stations. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.